Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, we're going to do a fast and loose tonalist watercolor landscape painting. The composition I haven't thought of yet. I just saturated my paper with water. It is a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 100% cotton, 140-pound cold press. So it's Thursday. It's after work. It's been a long work week. I still have work tomorrow. So when I said I really haven't thought about the composition, I really haven't. It's just um, me painting for the sake of painting. And uh, maybe we'll discover some things as we go along. Feel free to follow along. And um, if you have any questions, comments, leave them down below. So I'm going to start with some raw sienna. And... I'm going to establish my horizon line. I usually use raw sienna if I'm working with multiple colors as kind of a compositional tool. It helps me set everything up and see where I want everything to go. You know what? Let's raise this horizon line a little bit higher up. It's about halfway with the sheet. Go a little bit above that. Do a rolling hills type feel. Like we're looking out over it from a high vantage point. All right, so if it's gonna be that high up, Let's grab some ultramarine blue and get the sky in. With raw sienna, it mixes to kind of a gray, so you don't really have to worry about greens in the sky with that mix. Give it a little bit of an angle. I've been playing with light red oxide in the sky lately, so we'll feed a little bit of that in. And then from there, I'll grab a little Payton's Gray for some darker portions. Far distant clouds above the horizon. Make them nice and thin to give that distant feel. The ones that get larger are going to be higher in the sky and closer to us. All right. So, I was saying I use raw sienna to kind of map out. So let's see, we'll have our far distance. We might have to come back in when it's dry for a little bit more structure. Flattening the paper. Let's let this area be a distant lake, some water. Now, when I'm working my way back to front with the idea of perspective, my masses, whether it's a flat plane, um, a flat expansion of water, I want to generally increase the size, the vertical height of it. So you could see the height here versus that height there on the paper. It's going to be smaller as it recedes back. It's going to take up more space as it comes forward. A watery stream coming up back in there. Okay. Grab a little bit of ultramarine blue. I really don't use ultramarine blue that much for water, uh, mainly because I live down in Louisiana and the water down here is kind of that brackish, muddy, dark water. 
honestly the kind of water where you're kind of like I don't want to put my hand in it because I don't know what's on the other side of the water like what's underneath this is some pants gray right along that edge probably wind up darkening the water All right, we'll go with the light red oxide ultra remix for uh, a dark purple or a distant purple. Sorry. Create that back here. Bit of the deflection in the water. I'm gonna have a mass come in front. I'm going to warm it up a little bit with some burnt sienna. Have this ridge come up higher. That comes in front. More burnt sienna, ultramarine. That combination is just really common in art books. Um, James Fletcher Watson used the raw sienna whenever he was working his way forward with uh, the Rolling Hills. Um, hmm, who else? Uh, Rick S. on YouTube uses that combination to go back and forth. Jane Blundell um, mixes it uh, as a prepared mixture and she calls it um, Jane's Gray. I think I mentioned Rick S, how he uses it to go back and forth. Uh, mixing some um, raw sienna in it. Ron Ranson, he utilizes it, utilized it. So this will be our vantage point up here. I'm going to grab some um, raw umber, which you might not have on your palette. Um, I'm just using it as a kind of dark brown. In oil paintings, if I use it, it's kind of a background color. And it kind of pushes for me a little bit on the green side, so the cooler side of things. but. I just want a dark, earthy foreground. If we grab some ultramarine, we sorry, um, burnt umber, we can put that in. As you can probably tell, I'm quite just tired from the work week. Here is some Payne's Gray. That's Hammy climbing around. I'm gonna grab this guy to play around with. This is the number 10 Atler Squirrel Blend Quill. I think I got this off of uh, Blick.com. I'd wanted to kind of just do a painting where I played around with that, but it has not happened yet. Grab some light red oxide, ultramarine, my dark purple, I'm gonna flatten my paper out. So we're still wet and wet. One thing I wanna harp on is, you know, being down in Louisiana, we do have a lot more humidity going on. I think it's probably 83 outside right now. And in the house, it's probably 65. But that being said, you know, it, there's humidity and that probably prevents the paper from drying as fast as it might for you all. Try to put these distant elements in, the wet and wet. 
and warm up as we get closer. This is something I've always struggled with. I really enjoy these large, vast scenes, but it's something I have a lot of difficulty with painting. As you can tell, I had no preparation jumping into this painting. It was literally just painting to paint. A little bit of paint's gray. But as a fan of the Hudson River Valley movement and um, the romantic artists and all the other people of the 1800s, it's just quite a common theme to have vast expansions. Yeah, Hammy. It might just be because I haven't seen one in quite a few years in person, like being out and about in a hilly area or um, you know, I hiked as a Boy Scout. I grew up in um, New York. Some burnt sienna and paints gray. And I've had a lot of those scenes that I had seen probably painted by the Hudson River Valley painters. And I do recall some artists saying, uh, well, light red oxide, sorry, um, raw sienna and let's do ultramarine. Some artists saying, like, you can enjoy a style of painting and you don't have to paint in it. But this is something that I would like to. Um, one day have a somewhat of a command over. I'd say uh, Stuart Davies in his oil tunnelist paintings gets quite a bit of depth with his landscapes. I should rewatch those and he makes it seem so easy. Simple swipes with the um, chip brush and creating a sense of depth and land masses and Hammy trying to climb into my lap. Buddy, not right now, dude. Just grabbing the hake. <laughs> I'll let you hang out on my lap in a bit, bud. Hammy is a fantastic cat and I absolutely love him. All right, I'm sorry guys, let me grab Hammy. Hammy, you wanna come sit in my lap? I'm gonna paint around you, okay? All right, so I got a hammy in my lap. So I apologize if cat hair starts flying all over the place. You can probably hear him purring. Can you see his ears? <laughs> ah, such a good boy. So I'm grabbing the hake brush, uh, some Payne's gray. Trying to build up that foreground. I was rambling a little bit about my desire to uh, paint these vast scenes, but Hammy just melted all my worries away, right, buddy? I think uh, vertical elements will be something that will be helpful. So I'll either scrape them in or I'll grab the number one. Let's grab some uh, light lemon yellow. Maybe get some uh, green elements in there. That might be what I need. Lemon yellow. I'll do ultramarine so I don't get too wild with the palette. Can we get a green right now? Maybe not.
sap green might be helpful if I can reconstitute that. There we go. It's a little bit of sap green. On the closer portions. The reason being is atmospheric perspective. Um, I believe the general recipe is as you recede in a picture plane, you lose your yellows first, then you lose your reds, and you know, at last you're at your blues. So when I did my far distant, I did purple, then I warmed it up with the red, and now we have the yellow aspect in it. Grab a random scraping tool. Our foreground is gonna have texture in it. Do a little, just more kind of concentrated vertical elements for taller trees. So I'm using the same texture, but to represent completely different things. Wide scrapes. Just letting that happen. You done, Hammy? There you go, bud. All right. Oh, I swear I didn't drop them. All right, let's pause this and we'll do a dry off. All right, we're about 17 minutes in. Not bad. With the dry off, we did have quite a shift take place and we lost the richness of the greens. So I'm putting out some fresh lemon yellow and we're going to try to pull that back in. And we'll play around with our foreground and then kind of just play it by ear and go with the flow. All right, a little bit of ultramarine in there. And we'll dapple that in. Just going more vertical strokes here for the representation of grass, the dappling for the tops of distant trees. Payne's gray. To put in our shadows in the darker portions. Some vertical elements. And then more of a brush stroke for grass. Just scrubbing in and darkening that corner. I'm gonna take a play from Thomas Cole and put a kind of broken tree right here. I think that's exactly what I'm gonna wind up doing. I believe it's the Oxbow Bend is the name of the painting. I have a print of it hanging up in my classroom. I teach high school math and Every so often, when the kids are totally not stressing me out, I go over and look into it. Kind of a broken tree. Up. Payne's gray. Just using this quill on the side. Got a little bit of that texture. Payne's gray, P 
repeating in a darker portion. I was um, talking about that and exploring that in previous videos. So I won't go into too much detail here. You know, let's get some of these awesome strokes in this foreground. Explore the possibilities and the textures that can take place with this brush. Grabbing a scraping tool given to me by YouTuber Mr. Mega. I'm playing around with a little bit more detailed twigs and branches. I just can't help but do them fast though because of the time that it takes if you were to sit there and really kind of plan them out. So I just kind of let the brush kind of create it through different tensions different flicks. Alright. It's just I'm just kind of exploring here now. Now it's a big jump into the background. Putting in these watery wash lines, my thinking is it's like a hazy effect. It also creates a sense of perspective. Looks like perspective lines, horizontal ones. And what if we go in and put little trees on them? This is where we start struggling. Remember I do the distant fiddling. Let me follow the contour of the land here. Maybe that's what it is. What's the phrase? Nothing to it, but to do it. You gotta do it to to learn. Introduce a little bit of greenage back here. I think there's one artist, um, I think his name's Herman Peckle. I think he, he uses the quill brushes. There's quite a few, and um, I'm just in awe at what they're able to do with it. But I think if you're watching this as an artist and as you progress, you'll find what tools you like and you enjoy, and what works for you. I wonder if I could make these look 
like little trees. Let's grab the number one. It might be kind of like just taking a fan brush to put in the um, the parts of a pine tree. I'm just using this guy to create the tops of trees. Just little groupings. I think that's what it was with Bob Ross and just a lot of painters. You just find your little formulas that work for you. All along that receding line. All right, I'm going to pause it and do a dry off and we'll sign it. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed. Please like, subscribe, follow. If you want to follow along, feel free. I encourage you to sign your name. You have my express permission to sell anything you do when you follow one of these tutorials. I want you all to be successful and have um, the money and the means to get more art supplies. If you want to support this channel, I have a whole bunch of ways down below. The Patreon with exclusive content, the YouTube membership, etc. Or you can just directly donate. Thank you so much for all your support. You all have a great day.